Over the course of my first year sewing, I've had a lot of time to reflect and think about different aspects of this journey. One of the things that I've considered extensively is what techniques specifically did I need to know in order to make historical fashion. Historical sewing is completely different than contemporary sewing in many regards, and for that reason there is a series of techniques and methods that an individual needs to learn in order to construct historical clothing. I feel quite fortunate in a sense because I never actually learned contemporary sewing, I just dove right into historical sewing. So because of that, I really got to begin my knowledge with a clean slate. But I know how frustrating it can be, especially if you're just starting to know which techniques you're going to continuously come across. Which is why I put together this little video. It's going to cover the 15 historical sewing techniques that you must learn. Okay, maybe must is a pretty strong word because obviously you're a human with free will so you can do whatever you want to do with your life. But I do think that learning these can make your life a lot lot easier because it can show you what to expect. Whilst constructing 18th and 19th century fashion specifically, these are the techniques that I have continuously come across, and I can pretty much guarantee you that if you are sewing these same eras, there is an extreme likelihood that you're going to come across these things too. I should make a little disclaimer that I'm not going to be demonstrating every single technique in this video. If I did that, honestly, we would probably be here all day because it would take quite a bit of time. I have filmed tutorials on some of these elements, so I will definitely be sure to include those in the cards or in the description box down below, and if there is a specific video that helped me learn one of these techniques, I will be including that in the description box down below as well. That way, as you're going through this list and learning about some of the extra details, you'll have resources to take you to the next step of the learning process. So the very first technique is hand stitching. Even if you choose to construct your historical clothing by machine, there are some parts of historical sewing that are either impossible or extremely difficult to not finish by hand. For this reason, it's potentially vital to learn some of the essential hand sewing stitches, so that way if you do come across one of these instances, you'll know exactly what to do. There are a few essential hand sewing stitches that I find I continuously gravitate towards, and for that reason, in the early days of this channel, which I guess was like seven or eight months ago, I put together a seven essential hand sewing stitches video. So if you're unsure of how to get started with learning hand sewing, I will link that in the cards above so you can refer to that video. The second technique is learning to line garments in a historical manner. So the two options that I've come across the most often, I tend to refer to as the Georgian method and the Victorian method. For the Georgian method, you're essentially going to flip under your seam allowances and then wrong side to wrong side, you're going to whip stitch the edges of the entire garment, and that is essentially how you are going to line your garment. So rather than sewing everything together, right sides to right sides, you're going to do it the other way around and instead connect the two pieces. The reason I call this the Georgian method is because you tend to come across this a lot in 18th century construction. The Victorian method, on the other hand, involves flatlining the garment, so essentially making a duplicate in your lining fabric and then basting the two pieces together. This is going to cause the seam allowances to still be exposed with in the garment, and then you have to finish the seam allowances using whip stitches or maybe a ribbon binding. As you can see, both methods are extremely effective, but they are quite different in practice. Personally, I really like to use the Georgian method because I think it helps to create a much cleaner finish, but when it comes to a structured Victorian bodice that has boning or something like that, I will typically then use the Victorian method instead. These two methods serve as alternatives to the contemporary way of lining, which I think is referred to as bag lining. I find that the Georgian method in particular is actually much faster than bag lining, and that's because with bag lining you typically have to still stitch everything down so that the lining stays flat, but with the Georgian method, it's sort of all in one go. You just pin everything together and just whip stitch it all around and it all works perfectly. The third technique that you're going to need to learn is pleating. Pleating is used so often in historical fashion. It's actually quite difficult, I think, to find a dress that doesn't have some sort of pleating system involved. You are especially going to want to learn the knife pleat, the box pleat, and the cartridge pleat. In my 18th century under petticoat tutorial, I do show how to do both knife and box pleats, and in my Victoria 
inventory and apron tutorial, I do teach you how to do cartridge pleats. So I've placed all of those links down below. Number four is probably one of the most crucial techniques, and that is learning how to shorten or lengthen a pattern piece. This is not only useful for bodices, but for skirts as well. That is because almost nobody has the standard center back length, and almost nobody is the standard height. Pretty early on in your sewing journey, I would highly recommend that you find out if you are short or long-waisted. Being short or long-waisted and then cutting out your bodice pieces at the standard center back length is going to cause a number of fit issues. In fact, it took me probably about two or three projects to finally realize that I have an extremely short waist. Once I did realize that and I started making adjustments, all of my clothes started fitting me way better. The other issue too is that once you've already cut out your fabric, it's quite difficult to make a short or long waist adjustment. This is really something that needs to be done before any of your fabric is even cut out. And I think shortening or lengthening a skirt is also pretty self-explanatory because obviously you're going to have to decide how long you want your skirts to be. The fifth technique is a stitch that I actually left out on my essential hand sewing stitches video, and that is one called the English stitch. The English stitch is used quite extensively throughout 18th century construction in particular. It is in essence a great way to be able to put two constructed pieces together, and it serves as a wonderful alternative to the back stitch. So for an 18th century bodice back, for instance, you're going to create all of your back pieces. Now you're probably wondering, how are all of my individual pieces going to connect? This is where the English stitch comes into play. Laying your constructed and lined pieces right sides to right sides, you're then going to go in and English stitch them all the way together. And in the end, you're going to end up with a strong and sturdy seam. You can see how this would be extremely beneficial in a number of circumstances. And I also think it's quite satisfying because it sort of feels like your garment is coming together a lot quicker because you can already see it taking shape pretty early on. The sixth technique is learning how to evenly hem dresses and skirts. I personally like to put my garment onto a dress form and then I use a hem marker, which is an incredible device Device to get a perfectly even hem. I do this, of course, over all of the underpinnings as well because different things like a false rump or a bum roll can completely change the way that your hem will drape. When I first started sewing, I just couldn't figure out how to get everything to hem evenly. And then I found out about these hem marking devices and it completely changed my world and I am never going back to guessing ever again. You can find a vintage one from especially the 40s, 50s, and 60s on eBay for quite cheap. So I would definitely try and look out for one of those if you are having trouble getting your hems to be even. The seventh technique is learning how to construct and put together princess seams. Princess seams are those curved ones that you often see on the back of Victorian bodices. You can also see them on other garments. For instance, my 18th century Redingo had princess seams. You are basically guaranteed to come across these extensively with historical sewing. And in the beginning, it just doesn't quite make sense how two completely different shaped pieces are somehow going to come together and eventually become a wearable bodice. I struggled with these for the longest time until I finally practiced some of them a little bit and they became incredibly intuitive. So yes, this is a method that I would highly recommend. Technique number eight is learning how to make stroked gathers and ease and gathering in general. Ease and gathering are odd concepts because it's hard to kind of visualize how they can work until you actually begin to grab your fabric and start manipulating it. Stroked gathers are important for after you've gathered your fabric because then you can pull on them and even them out. That way everything stays nice and consistent. Number nine is learning how to make simple garment alterations. There are a number of things you can do to alter a garment that don't actually require much work. For example, if you have buttons or hooks and eyes, you can slightly move those over an inch or a half inch or two, and it will actually adjust the fit of the garment. Personally, my weight tends to fluctuate a lot, and so because of that, I will often have to move hooks and eyes or buttons around so that things fit me again. Technique number 10 is one that I am still learning and am still getting better at, and that is pattern matching. Pattern matching is definitely one of the more complicated aspects, I think, of working with non-solid colored fabrics. There are quite a few good videos on the internet on this topic, so I will be sure to include those down below. Just know that if you are struggling with pattern matching, you are definitely not alone. I think that many of us find this to be very challenging. Number 11 is piecing. 
Pacing is very, very period. You can see this being utilized in a number of extant garments. And that's just because sometimes people didn't have enough fabric to get a specific part of a garment constructed, or maybe they messed up somewhere and then they had to fix it, or maybe they didn't cut enough fabric. There are so many reasons for why someone might actually want to piece a garment, but there are certain methods I think we can learn to improve the way that our piecing looks. Just know that while piecing can sometimes be a frustrating step or decision to make, it is nothing to beat yourself up over and and it is a completely natural thing that so many people who sew historical sewing end up having to do. In fact, just recently when I sewed a talma, I had to piece the entire lining together twice because I just didn't have enough fabric to get it done. So yes, piecing is completely historically accurate and it is nothing to be ashamed of. Technique number 12 is knowing how to prep all of your fabrics for sewing. You will definitely want to prep your fabrics before you start making anything out of them. And so if you are unfamiliar with what to do, I have made a fabrics care crash course video, which I will link above. In this video, I go through a lot of the processes of what it is like to prep and care for each one of the different types of fabrics that typically are used in historical sewing. Those being cotton, linen, silk, and wool. Once you do learn exactly what to do, it actually becomes a very natural and automatic part of beginning to sew different garments. Number 13 is two-piece sleeve construction. You'll see two-piece sleeves a lot for historical garments that are inspired by menswear. So far I've had to do them for riding habits and riding goes and for this walking suit that I'm currently wearing. They're a little bit faffy and difficult to put together at first, but once you do learn how the pieces look and you get familiar with the general construction, they become far more effortless. Well, as effortless as any type of sleeve construction can be. Let's be honest, none of us enjoy really making sleeves, and if you do, please tell me your secrets. <laughs> Technique number 14 is pin tucks. You see pin tucks all throughout the Victorian era and into the Edwardian era as well. I'm sure you see them in different periods too, but those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. These are fairly straightforward, but again, they are a method that needs to be learned and needs to be practiced. Number 15, which is the final technique, is knowing how to grade and scale a pattern. Not every pattern you get is going to be in your size. That would just be absolutely impossible. And Additionally too, your measurements don't need to be the standard. In fact, I would say that very few individuals are the standard size. For that reason, knowing how to grade and scale and alter pattern pieces so that they fit you is essential for making historical clothing that actually works. I would say that this is probably one of the most difficult parts about historical sewing or just any sewing in general, is learning how to make alterations and change up pattern pieces. It is a process that even experienced dressmakers and tailors are constantly learning new things about. So try not to get discouraged if you are finding this part to be extremely challenging. Each new garment that we construct is very much a learning experience. And I think one of the things a lot of us tend to learn from garment after garment is to correct these small fit issues until eventually we've found a way to create garments that really fit us well. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the 15 historical sewing techniques that I think are must knows. This list is by no means exhaustive. And so for that reason, if there are any other techniques you can think of that you feel like are must-knows, please do write them in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all on Thursday for another video.